I want to talk today about tortuosity and loops during transradial cath, and I will focus on radial and brachial tortuosities. Generally, after I obtain radial access, I always start with a soft J-tipped wire that I advance blindly without fluoro. Now, if I encounter difficulty, this is when I go on fluoro. And first, I make sure to advance a catheter close to the back of the wire to provide pushability. If despite that, I cannot advance the J wire, then I try to advance under a fluoro, but without any angiography, a soft a floppy tip woolly wire, a slightly angled a woolly wire. I try to advance that. Most often this would go. It may be that the patient has a small artery or it may be that he has a you know, mild tortuosity that the J tip could not cross, but the soft woolly would cross. Do not use glide wire. At the level of the radial and brachial arteries, you have a lot of small branches and glide wire would go into those branches and would perforate without giving you any tactile feedback. Absolutely do not use a glide wire at the level of the arm and the forearm high risk of perforation. So I try woolly blindly. If it does not go, then at this point, I will do in geography, subtraction in geography through the sheath or the catheter with a smart mask. And I watch for loops, accessory radial branches, but also for perforation that I may have induced. And I will start with a case to illustrate the steps I follow. So this is a patient on whom I could not advance a J-wire past the elbow. I tried a woolly wire. The woolly wire went a little bit higher up, but it got stuck there. So at this point, I did subtraction in geography. And this is what we found. But this was done in an AP view, and there is actually a loop here. The loop is in line with the brachial ulnar artery, so this view is deceiving. You have to look from the side. You have to do an ipsilateral angled view to really open up that loop. And this is what we did here. We did REO, and we opened up that loop. That loop was here, superimposed on the brachial ulnar, we opened it up here. Note that the patient has his forearm internally rotated, and that's why the uh, ulnar appears here, whereas the radial artery is here. So we open the loop in REO, and note that on angiography, there isn't only a loop. There is a branch here that comes from the apex of the loop. And those are the two big issues with the loop. One, it's hard to cross it because it's tight. Two, there is always universally a branch coming off the top, the apex of the loop, a small artery coming from the top of this loop that we call accessory radial branch that may or may not join the brachial artery higher up. It's a small branch that's easy to perforate. And it's a problem because when you're wiring, the wire not only will not go in the main radial artery through the loop, it will tend to go into that path of least resistance and perforate that artery. So those are the two big issues of the loop. Don't forget that accessory radial branch. So what we did after angiography is under smart mask, we tried to cross the loop. First, we tried to use a woolly, the same woolly wire but it did not go and notice how that woolly wants to go into that branch here and how it wants to go into all branches. It crossed partially the loop, but it started to go into all the branches. Watch here, it's going to all the branches. So when you fail with the woolly under subtraction in geography, then you try the single most important step is to try an O14 inch wire 
such as a BMW wire or even a polymer O14, like a whisper extra support, which is what I used here. You put a large bend on the O14 inch wire to allow it to cross that loop. And watch here how it's going. It goes, then it will be able to take the loop and it goes up. You see it going up here. So you advance it as deep as possible. Then the next step is to advance over it the softest four French catheter that will allow you to eventually exchange the O14 for an O35 inch wire. So over that, we advance a glide cath. So after we get that wire deep, we're advancing here a glide cath, a four French glide cath. Notice that the loop had already straightened with the whisper of 14 inch wire and see the glide cath going up. So I use four French glide cath, which is the softest, most slippery four French that has enough of a lumen to allow you to exchange for an O35 inch wire. And this is what we did here. After advancing the glide cath on the BMW deep up into the arm, almost to the axilla, we remove the O14 inch and we exchange for an O35 inch uh, medium support wire, such as your J wire or a Rosen wire. And after doing this, we advance our coronary catheters. Here we tried to advance an AL1 a guiding catheter. It did not go over the O35 inch wire. So we ended up advancing an Icari left guiding catheter, which is more slippery guiding catheter and dimpled. There are other techniques to be able to advance that AL1 if that is what we absolutely needed. And I will explain that a little later. But let me go over and summarize the steps we do in, his, in such a case. So when soft J-wire does not advance, give a vigorously nitroglycerin to eliminate any spasm, try woolly soft tip angled wire under fluoro without angiography, do not use a glide wire. Woolly might go in that semi-blind semi approach because the issue may just be a small radial or a minor tortuosity that J could not cross, but that Woolly will cross. Now, if Woolly does not cross in a, in a semi-blind fashion, then you do subtraction in geography with a smart mask. Then with a smart mask, you try to navigate the loop with a Woolly, but more often you'll end up needing to use an O14 inch wire or an O18 inch. You can use a V18 or an SV5 wire, which is more supportive and it will allow you to advance the subsequent catheter more easily. So you can try O18 inch or O14 coronary wire and you put a large bend on it, not sharp, but large bend on it. Then you advance the softest four French catheter such as glide cath across the loop. Then you exchange the O14 or O18 inch wire for O35 inch wire through the glide cath. Typically I use a regular J or if you need more support, Rosen wire. I try to avoid amplats, stiff wire because it causes wire bias. It may rub the artery eccentrically and may make the catheter eventually rub the artery and cause spasm or injury. Also, it may not go the amplat super stiff through that soft glide cath, or it may even kick it backward. So then over that O35 inch wire, I advance my coronary catheters. Now keep in mind a very important idea. To be able to advance the coronary catheter, the loop has to straighten at one of the prior points. It has to straighten with the BMW wire or with the O18 inch wire. That's one advantage of the O18. It's heavier, stiffer, it may straighten the loop. Or it may have to straighten once you advance the glide cath. Or it has to straighten when you have the glide cath with the O35 inch wire inside it. Once you have the glide cath with an O35 inch wire inside it, if the loop hasn't straightened yet, and here, look, when I advanced the O35 inch wire, it did straighten. Look, when you advance, it straightened. If it hasn't straightened yet, once you advance the wire, 
all the way up, you can just pull the system and that sometimes a little pull will straighten the loop. You may also pull the glide cath and the all 35 inch wire with a counterclockwise torque to straighten the loop as we did here. For the left radial, it's usually a pull with a clockwise torque. That sequential wire and catheter technique that I'm describing here is actually used in all peripheral interventions. Whenever you have any difficulty advancing wires or catheter in the peripheral vasculature, whether across tortuosity, calcium, or disease, this is a stepwise approach. You start with a soft wire deeply, which we did in this case, we use O14 or O18 inch wire, then over it a soft catheter deeply. Then you exchange for an intermediate wire deeply, then you, that you track with an intermediate catheter deeply. Then if needed a stiff wire, the stiffest wire, then a stiff heavy catheter or sheath. So this is a standard approach. For example, I use this when we're trying to cross heavy aortoiliac tortuosity in the groin access cases, when we have difficult sheath advancement across thick groin and in peripheral interventions. For example, you can use those same steps when we're trying to cross a steep aortoiliac bifurcation. In this case, I get soft glide wire with a soft four French omni flush catheter and I advance the glide wire deep and the omni flush deep over it. Then I exchange the glide wire for a stiffer, more supportive wire like Rosen wire so that I can advance a stiff sheath up and over the bifurcation. I will give you some modifications of that technique. Uh, what you can do after you advance your O14 inch or O18 inch wire, instead of advancing a glide cath and exchanging for an O35 inch wire, you can double wire with O14 or O18 inch wire. Remember, if you put two O14 inch wire, that becomes O28 inch. If you put two O18 inch wire, that's O36 inch. So basically you become close to having an O35 inch wire in that artery. So here, after I cross the loop with O14 inch uh, whisper, I could have put another O14 inch wire, or I could have put another O18 inch wire, and I could advance my coronary catheter straight over those, because now I have almost the body of an O35 inch wire. So that's one modification that you can use. However, if you're trying to advance a heavy coronary catheter, like a guiding catheter, a stiff one, it's best to exchange for an O35 inch rows and supportive wire and advance the guiding catheter over that wire. Another modification here, if you advance the O14 or O18 inch uh, through the loop, but the glide cath cannot track over it, then what you can do, you can double wire the loop with O14 or O18 inch, just so you can allow the glide cath to track over it. However, that loop has to straighten, whether with the double O14, O18, or with the glide cath. If it doesn't straighten after you advance the glide cath over double wires, it, you probably should abort. You're not going to be, be able to straighten that loop likely, and you're likely not going to be able to advance your coronary catheters. So I'm going to tell you what are the issues in general that we encounter uh, with radial access at the radial brachial level. The first issue is radial loop in 2.3% of the cases. The smaller and tighter the loop, the more difficult it is, especially if it is a calcified loop. Those tight, small loops that are calcified may not be straightened with your sequential steps. And in that case, you're not going to be able to advance your coronary catheter. Another issue with the loop, like I described, is having at its apex that small accessory radial artery that tends to perforate. Hence the reason never glide wire to cross radial loops. Second issue you may encounter in 2% of the cases are severe tortuosity, more than 90 degree angles, especially if calcified. Milder tortuosity usually may be crossed blindly with a woolly wire 
or semi-blindly, under fluoro but without angiography. Third issue that you encounter is quite common, is what we call the high branching radial artery from the mid or high humerus at the brachial or even axillary level. This is seen in actually 7% of radial anatomy. So it's very common and you need to be familiar with it. There are two types of high branching radial artery. In one type, you actually have one main radial artery that branches normally at the elbow, and you have an accessory radial artery that branches higher up at the humerus level. And that accessory radial artery may be small, like in here, or maybe normal size. This is usually not very problematic. Because what you do in those cases, if your wire goes into the small accessory radial artery, under angiographic guidance, you try to direct your wire into the main radial artery at the elbow level. It is a problematic if it is a small and you don't recognize that you've gone into the small high branching radial artery and you get your gear all the way into the aorta and the coronaries, one, it will be difficult to advance that gear. And worse, if you advance it and get it to the coronary, it will be very hard to get it out. You'll get massive spasm and constriction at your gear and your devices may get stuck. You may need general anesthesia to be able to pull them out. So that's one type of high branching radial artery, the accessory type where you still have a main regular radial artery at the elbow. The second type is where you only have a high branching radial artery, your only radial artery is high branching. And in that case, most often that high branching radial artery is of a good size. So you may not even recognize it in your case. Your catheter and your gear will go through it with no issue. It becomes a problem if that high branching radial artery is a small, or if it has a sharp angulation with the brachial or axillary artery. If it is a small, you may have to abort because you're not gonna be able to advance your gear potentially, and there is no rear radial artery to redirect your gear into at the elbow level. But most often it's okay. In about 1% of the time, that high branching radial artery will cause issues and cause you to abort. This study from 2009 shows that radial anatomical variation are quite common. They are seen in 13.8% of patients. Radial loops and tortuosity are associated with the highest failure rate, especially radial loops where the risk of failure was 37%. High bifurcation by itself without loop rarely caused failure. So I described my technique to cross loops and tortuosity. It's the 014, 018 inch wire and four French glide cath technique. There is another technique famous in the literature that is called balloon assisted tracking that you may use. In that technique, you basically cross the loop with an 014 inch wire and over the O14 inch wire, you advance your coronary catheter using balloon, inflated balloon at its tip. So here I'm showing a demonstration of that. This is a case I did. There was a radial loop. I advanced an O14 inch BMW wire. That BMW wire straightened the loop. And then I brought a 1.5 millimeter by 15 millimeter coronary balloon, monorail balloon. I advanced it through the catheter and I made half of it hang out of the catheter. It will serve like a dilator, like a smoothening tool at the tip of that catheter. So we inflated it at the tip, halfway out of the tip, and we advanced the whole system in sync, the balloon wire and catheter through the loop. But note for that balloon assisted tracking technique to work, you really need to straighten that loop specifically straighten with the wire. It's hard to advance the catheter with a balloon inflated at its tip across a very tight loop that has not been straightened, specifically with the wire. 
This was a five French catheter. So I use 1.5 by 15 millimeter balloon. If it was a six French catheter or guide catheter six French, I would use two millimeter by 12 or 15 millimeter balloon. And we typically inflate those balloons at six to eight atmosphere. So this is a summary. We cross the loop with an 014 inch coronary wire. We uh, advance 1.5 or two by 15 millimeter uh, coronary balloon, monorail balloon. We inflate it partially halfway in the catheter and halfway protruding out of it. And we inflate it at about six atmosphere and we advance the whole system in sync. This balloon assisted tracking is particularly advantageous when the O35 inch wire crosses the artery, but the catheter, especially guide, cannot track over it because of a razor effect. So sometimes you advance in my technique, you advance an O35 inch wire, but the catheter doesn't track over it because of the gap between the catheter and the wire, especially a guiding catheter. This is what you call razor effect. So it gets stuck against the arterial wall or worse, it causes a spasm or worse, it causes a dissection. So the balloon assisted tracking over an O14 inch wire keeps that catheter centered and prevent that razor effect. However, there are disadvantages, like I mentioned, to the balloon assisted tracking. It works best if O14 inch wire has straightened or attenuated the loop. May not work well in tight calcified loops, but then again, in tight calcified loops, even the O35 inch and glide cast technique may not work. Pros is that it is advantageous when loop straightened, but catheter does not track over O35 inch wire because of the razor effect. And another advantage is that it works very well in small radial arteries, spastic radial, tortuosity by reducing that rubbing razor uh, guide injury effect. So it works more in those than it works in tight loops. So in the case I showed earlier where I said I was able to advance an O35 inch uh, Rosen wire, but I could not track the amplex left guide over it. What I could have done in this case, I could have switched to a BAT technique where I advance an O14 inch wire and over the O14 inch wire, I inflate a, a balloon and I advance the system in sync. So BAT may have worked. Uh, we advance an ICARI left successfully here, but BAT may have worked with an AL1. Another technique I could have used in this case, I could have advanced next to that O35 inch wire, an O14 inch supportive wire, like a grand slam. The guide catheter lumen has enough room for O35 inch plus O14 inch. So I could have advanced those instead of doing that, that will have plugged the hole of the guiding catheter and kept it centered and prevented the razor effect. And I would have been able to advance AL1. So keep that in mind. You cannot advance the catheter over O35 inch. Well, think of either BAT, in which you'll have to switch back to O14 inch wire, or think of adding an O14 inch wire through a guiding catheter. So. Here I'm showing you can get creative if you use the glide cast technique, but the guide catheter not tracking over O35 inch wire may add O14 inch next to O35. Another creative idea in difficult balloon assisted tracking cases, you can advance two O14 inch wires and inflate a balloon over one of the wires. This will only work if you have a guiding catheter. So here, if I'm trying to advance a guiding catheter over O14 inch wire and the loop is still somewhat tight, what I can do, I can advance double O14 inch wire to further straighten the loop and do balloon assisted tracking over one of the wire. That technique will only work in a guiding catheter, which is the catheter where you encounter most difficulty in advancing it. The guiding catheter will fit two or 14 inch wires with a balloon. Also throughout all those cases, give good sedations and fentanyl and good do doses of nitroglycerin, at least 200 microgram and verapamil, at least half a milligram through the radial sheath. 
If pain while advancing a wire, that means you are in small branch, stop. I want to describe the most important complication that can happen with those maneuvers. Actually, in the case I showed, we had a perforation with the initial attempts with the woolly wire. Perforation of that small recurrent radial artery coming from the apex of the loop. So what do you do when a perforation happens? What we did was actually the standard. So even if a perforation happens, continue with attempts of trying to cross properly using that 014 inch wire and glide cath technique or the BAT technique and advance your catheter across the area where there is a perforation. The catheter itself will actually serve to tampon at that area and stop the bleeding. The treatment is to pursue your case and create tamponade with your catheter. However, if you have a big perforation, especially if you have used the glide wire, which you shouldn't, then in that case, before you persevere with your O14 wire and your catheters, it may be a good idea to inflate a blood pressure cuff over systolic blood pressure for 10 minutes before you attempting to cross. Also, after you cross and hope that positioning your catheter will create a seal of the bleed, at the end, when you take your catheter out and when you finish your diagnostic or your interventional procedure, always at the end, repeat the angiogram to verify that the perforation is still sealed despite heparin and despite removing the sealing catheter. By the way, even if you need to intervene and give higher doses of heparin, it's totally fine. That's what we did in this case. This case was a STEMI. So despite this perforation, we persevered, we placed a guiding catheter across, we gave heparin, and at the end we took it out and we verified there was no longer any bleeding. Also make sure through the case to ask the nurse to keep palpating the forearm and the elbow, make sure there is no expanding hematoma. Then at the very end, you verify again with an angiogram. If the radial brachial perforation has not sealed at the end with the removal of the guide, you can do any of the following, possibly in combination. You can inflate the blood pressure cuff again at systolic blood pressure level proximal to the perforation site or place compression device at the forearm at the perforation site or manual pressure at the perforation site in conjunction with the blood pressure cuff inflation. You can also readvance your guiding catheter and keep it across the perforation for an additional 20 minutes and partially reverse your heparin with protamine. And you can do those two in conjunction, inflating the blood pressure cuff, manual compression, and repositioning your guiding catheter. If those maneuvers do not stop the bleeding after 20 minutes, then you can inflate a 2.5 millimeter balloon across the perforation site for 20 minutes. You may use a coronary balloon advanced transradially over a 0.014 inch wire. If that does not work, bleeding persists despite all that, or if growing hematoma, definitely you need to consider or call the vascular surgeon. Some have described, putting a covered stent like papyrus, coronary covered stent, but the standard is to call the vascular surgery. And by the way, what I described is supported by several case series. Several case series describe that advancing a guiding catheter after crossing was the treatment of radial perforation. Those are other case series suggesting the same. So you do not need to abort and go for another access. This is another case. So we see here, we advance a J-wire. The J-wire went all the way up to the axilla, but we could not track a catheter over it. Whenever you see this image, memorize this image. J-wire goes all the way to the top, but a catheter doesn't track over it. Think, I must be in an accessory radial artery that is high branching. Maybe there is a loop, maybe there isn't. 
keep in mind that an accessory radial artery may arise from a loop or may arise without a loop. And you should be thinking of doing an angiogram. So that's what we did in this case. We did an angiogram and indeed, we see a loop, same thing. This angiogram is deceiving because the loop is actually here. This is the artery, radial artery, and it's looping like here. There is 360 degree loop here in line with a brachial radial. Again, you should look from the side to see it well. And very likely there is a high branching accessory radial coming from the apex of that loop and going all the way up to the axillary artery. So we try to cross that loop with a woolly wire under a smart mask. And you can see the wire is going all the way straight into a high branching artery. It's not in line with the rear radial brachial artery. This is where the wire wants to go. As such, we placed a large band on the woolly and we advanced it with the support of a glide cath in the main radial artery. We did not need to use O14 or O18 inch wire here. And we advanced the woolly as deep as we can. Then we advanced the glide cath over a woolly to straighten that loop. And with the wire and glide cath deep, we pulled and counterclocked the system and we were able to straighten the loop. Then we were able to advance a guiding catheter a CLS guiding catheter over the O35 inch wire after the loop straightened. I have another case here. This is a patient where our J wire and woolly wire will get stuck at the mid arm level past the elbow. So we did an angiogram and what we see is actually there is a high branching radial artery that's the only radial artery. There is no radial artery branching at the elbow. There is only one radial artery that is high branching at the uh, high brachial level. It is of large size. However, it has a sharp bend with a loop at the junction that the woolly could not cross. We did subtraction in geography and we try woolly under subtraction with no success. We were able to cross with an O14 inch wire, as you see here, we cross it with an O14 inch BMW wire with a large band. Then what I chose to do here, instead of using the glide cath technique and exchanging for uh, O35 inch and then eventually our coronary catheter, I chose through the guiding catheter to advance a second O14 inch BMW wire to make it O28 inch. And I was able to advance that. Then I tracked my CLS guiding catheter over those two wires. Notice that those two wires actually straighten the loop. And you can see here how I was able to advance it. Watch here how it's going. I got it through what was a loop. Now it's straightened. However, interestingly, I could not advance the guide past this point. It got stuck at this point. You could think of getting a glide cath and putting a supportive O35 inch wire, then advancing the EBU catheter over it. That's one technique. A second technique is to do balloon assisted tracking, meaning once my guiding catheter gets to this point, I inflate a balloon over one of the wires, two, two millimeter balloon over one of the wire, make it partially protrude and advance all of them in sync. Not just balloon assisted tracking, balloon assisted tracking with two O14 inch wires. The third technique that I chose to do in this case was to actually remove one O14 inch wires and advance an O35 inch wire instead. This way, I create O35 inch with O14 inch support for that catheter. And you can see here, I advance an O35 inch J wire alongside the BMW wire. Then I was able to advance the guiding catheter easily over that combo. I will move on to describe another difficulty that you may encounter at the innominate subclavian level. 
typically as you're advancing your wire through the subclavian artery, it will tend to go into the innominate artery down. It has less propensity to go into the carotid because the carotid is coming at a 90 degree angle. However, in some patient, the angle between the subclavian and the innominate is very sharp and close to 90 degree, while the angle into the carotid artery is smooth between the subclavian and the carotid artery. So the wire and gear will tend to go into that carotid artery. This is actually a fairly common instance. So what I do in this, those cases, I ask the patient to take a deep breath. Deep breath will elongate the lungs and it will flatten the top of the lung so much that that angulation may become more favorable into the innominate artery. So the angle into the carotid may become more steep while the angle into the innominate may become more flat. That's one. Second, I don't just use stainless steel J-wire. I may switch to a soft J-tip glide wire. Remember how I told you to never use a glide wire at the forearm and arm level and at the axillary level because you have a lot of small branches there that you would perforate. However, you can use a glide wire at the level of subclavian innominate and at the aortic level, and it is handy in those cases. Why? Even if the J-wire goes into the innominate, it will tend to prolapse out of it. So even if it gets in it, it may prolapse out of it if you keep pushing because it wants to take the path of least resistance. Whereas a glide wire, a slippery soft wire, when it takes the path of more resistance, it will stick in it even if you push it furthermore. You may use an REO angle instead of an AP. REO opens well that subclavian carotid angulation. So this is a summary of the steps. Three tips, deep breath, glide wire, torquing the catheter in multiple direction while keeping it down, may use REO. If you keep getting up, it may mean that your catheter is already in the carotid. In this case, pull back your catheter quite a bit before redirecting and trying again. If you keep encountering difficulty, it's possible that your innominate has an occlusion, but this should be realized before your case, because we should always measure blood pressure in both arms in those patients before we start the case. Another issue we encounter at the aortic level is the catheter and wire go into the descending aorta. This is an easy to solve issue. What you do, you advance your wire and catheter deep in the descending aorta, then you pull the wire inside the catheter, and pull the catheter with a counterclock maneuver until it jumps. You see it jump from the descending to the ascending aorta. You don't need deep breath here. Deep breath helps in almost every step of radial engagement, except that step is not absolutely necessary. And this is an illustration here. So we're pulling with a counterclock, keep pulling with a counterclock and you'll see it jump. And once it jumps, then you advance your wire. This is another illustration. So you're pulling the catheter with a counterclock. And once it jumps, you advance your wire. And the way you have it, you have both your hands at the back end of the catheter. You pull with your left hand. And once you see the jump, your right hand is ready to push the wire into the ascending aorta. Now, this can happen from left radial. If your wire goes into the descending aorta while you're coming from the left radial, you do the same hand maneuvers except for a clockwise torque. So you advance your gear in the descending aorta, then you pull your catheter with a clockwise torque and you'll see it jump into the ascending aorta. Other issues we encounter are subclavian innominate loops and sharp ascending aorta to innominate angulation. This is an illustration of an innominate sub subclavian loop. 
This is fairly common from a right radial axis. It's seen in about 10 to 15% of patients, especially elderly, hypertensive, short, and women, and African Americans. It is less common from a left radial axis. Small calcified loops are toughest. The way you navigate those loops is you frequently need a soft angled glide wire that you advance and you slip it through all the way to the SNA aorta and over it you track a diagnostic catheter. You're not going to be able to track a guiding catheter over the glide wire through that loop. So you get a glide wire through the loop, then a diagnostic catheter, five French, maybe six French diagnostic catheter. And once you get the catheter as far down as you can, you pull a little bit on the system to straighten it. If that doesn't work to straighten it, once you get the catheter as far down as you can, you can pull that wire out and advance a more robust wire, such as a regular J or a Rosen wire. That will allow you to advance the catheter a little more, and that will allow you to straighten the loop more readily. So this is what we do. Deep breath is key in those cases. So deep breath, a glide wire with a soft diagnostic catheter, a guide catheter will not be able to advance here. Then you get a medium wire, like a Rosen wire. Then once you are in the SNA aorta, the loop will straighten. If it doesn't straighten, you pull a little on the whole system to straighten it. This is another illustration of such a process. So a glide wire, then you can advance the catheter over it. Then potentially you can switch the glide wire to a regular wire and you pull the whole system to straighten it. Another issue that you will encounter frequently and that I have discussed extensively in my left coronary talks that I suggest you review is that sharp aorta to innominate angulation. How do you navigate that? So we have here the innominate is coming like this and you have a sharp angle into the aorta and a sharp angulation of the ascending aorta. The single most important step in those cases is deep breath and as the patient is deep breath you advance your catheter with a clockwise torque. If you advance your catheter without deep breath and without torque, you shove them forward, all you'll do, you'll either make the system prolapse into the descending aorta or you'll make the system loop on itself. So don't try to do that. Look how it's looping on itself. Rather, what you need to do here, after this happens, you pull back on the catheter, you advance your wire and make the patient take a deep breath and see what happens when he takes a deep breath. The whole aorta is elongated. Then you advance your catheter quickly as he's taking a deep breath with a clockwise torque. Look at what it does. It elongates the aorta. It makes it easy for you to get to the cusp. Even more importantly, it makes it easy for you to get to the left cusp. So it makes it easy for you to jump from right to left, left cusp, which is also a difficult step in patient with angulation. As you're trying to jump, the catheter may fly out, but having this aorta elongated with deep breath makes it easy to jump on the left cusp or go straight onto the left cusp. So those are the tips for both subclavian loops and sharp innominate aorta angulation deep breath for advancement and to jump into the left cusp. For left coronary artery, engage by looping from below to provide more stability. For both the right coronary and left coronary engagement, torque and maneuver while having a wire inside the catheter to prevent catheter kink. Normally, when we're doing left coronary engagement, we keep the wire in anyway until we're either engaged or close to engaged. But when you have a lot of loops, you need to do that even for right coronary engagement. And you have to give heparin as you're keeping the wire in for some time. Also for both right coronary and left coronary engagement, especially right coronary engagement, 
you may take your images while leaving the wire in place. So you don't just use the wire to allow you to torque and engage. You keep the wire in while you're imaging. Why is that? Because once you engage the coronary, if you take the wire out, those loops that you have on top will go back to their prior shape. They will become redundant again, and they will pull up your catheter and you will be disengaged. So it's important to keep the wire in as you're imaging. Furthermore, keeping the wire in may help you puff during engagement so you know for sure am I engaged or not. Now, how do you do that? How do you keep the wire in an image? In a diagnostic catheter, you will have to advance an O18 inch wire. There is no room inside a diagnostic catheter for O35 inch wire and contrast injection. So you'll have to advance an O18 inch wire and you put a co-pilot or a TUI at the back of the catheter so that you advance a wire through one port and you inject contrast through the other port. For a guiding catheter, you can actually keep an O35 inch wire in. There is enough room to put an O35 inch wire in and to give contrast through the co-pilot. And those are some illustration. This is a patient with a sharp aortic angulation. Here we're trying to engage the right coronary artery while having a wire in, an O35 inch wire in. So we successfully engaged here. So we engage here. The problem is when we took the wire out, the catheter will jump right up. We took the wire out and boom, the catheter flew out. So what we did in this case, we re-engage with a TUI and with an O18 inch wire that we kept inside the catheter. And we imaged while keeping the wire in, prevent the loops from straightening. Also, we kept the torque in. So we imaged while I kept the clockwise torque held with my hand. I want to discuss one final idea, which is dealing with refractory radial spasm, especially after you have advanced your catheter, in which case you may rarely get catheter entrapment. This is particularly the case in patients with small radial arteries, with loops, with tortuosities, or with advancing a catheter across a small, high-branching radial artery. You may be able to advance it through, but it's usually harder to pull out. The best treatment is to prevent this from happening by using good sedation and good cocktail of nitroglycerin and verapamil through the sheath initially, and also prevent it in those patients with a small radial artery and pain upon insertion, use a five French slender sheath and five French catheters. If you have severe spasm during your case, especially with catheter entrapment, there are several additional ideas you can do. So you can give nitroglycerin and verapamil systemically, through your catheters, or you can give sublingual nitroglycerin, or you can inject subcutaneous nitroglycerin, 200 microgram in the forearm. That can help. There are two other additional simple ideas that can help. You can apply warm blanket onto the forearm for three minutes. You can also use that flow-mediated dilatation technique where you inflate a blood pressure cuff at the arm for three minutes, 30 to 50 millimeter of mercury above the SBP. Then you deflate it. That will create a flow-mediated hyperemia and distal vasodilatation. If those techniques fail, then the last resort is to do deep sedation and or general anesthesia, or you can also do axillary brachial plexus block, where under ultrasound, an anesthesiologist inject local anesthetic into the brachial plexus.